Okay, here we are. Hello. Hi, Susan. Hello, Panyo. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks. I'm going to do a little official introduction for you. This is the part where you blush, where I say nice things about you. Okay. <laughs> um, Susan Kane, the, <laughs> the author of Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, uh, which has been translated into 40 languages and counting. It's in its seventh year on the New York Times bestseller list and was named the number one best book of the year by Fast Company Magazine. Her record-smashing TED Talk has been viewed over 30 million times and was named by Bill Gates as one of his all-time favorite talks. She's an honors graduate of Princeton and Harvard Law School and is also one of our four curators here at the Next Big Idea Club. And her newest book, Bittersweet, was an instant number one New York Times bestseller and the topic of our Q&A. So Susan, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Panyo. It's great to be here with you. I can't remember when it was that we first met in person, but I feel like it was a gazillion years ago and I've always loved talking to you. <laughs> Me too. It does feel like it's been a while. Like I've got little moments I can remember, like little conversations we had. Um, it's also fun to talk about your book because so often when I talk with you, I'm talking about other people's books. So it's it's a treat to talk about some of your ideas. Okay. Um, so let's start with, and, and a quick little caveat, or I think I'm using that wrong, preamble. Um, <laughs> We're going to talk about bittersweet, but and I'm going to hold the book up now because I just love this little book. And by the way, this is the to be true, to be fair, this is actually the version I read, which is the galley, which is all marked up and has little <laughs> little ha ha in the margin, <laughs> and then wow, the little line underneath it, and then ff fun fact. Um, so it's it's a great book. I I loved reading it. Um, so let's start. Uh, we'll talk about bittersweet, but you know, as the conversation moves around, we can talk about other things as well. I'm sure. Um, I always find it interesting to hear what authors think about after a book comes out because you know you've had the chance to talk to people and hear from people and get some of their responses and, and very often your ideas kind of progress as well. So uh, I'm sure you've done this a million times, but can you just define very quickly what bittersweetness is for people who maybe aren't familiar with the term? Yeah, I mean, so it's basically, <clears throat> excuse me, this state of being where you're very um, conscious of the way that joy and sorrow in this world are forever paired and that impermanence is such a fundamental part of what it is to be human so everything that we and everyone we love best will not be here forever um mm -hmm. but it's also at the same time like a kind of astonishing aliveness almost an ecstatic kind of aliveness mm -hmm. and joy at how beautiful everything is that actually comes from that that attunement to impermanence and to the presence of sorrow and longing. So it's a great big paradox. Um, and what's, what makes that this paradox so powerful and so worthy of talking about is how connected it is to states of creativity and to human connection and to mm -hmm. transcendence. Right. I mean, certainly it is so interesting, the sweet part, right? Because mm -hmm. we uh, there is so much joy throughout the book when you talk about it and you get there through this kind of thorny path. Um, you start the book talking about music, bittersweetness and music, right? You're a 22 year old um, law school student and your friends are kind of teasing you because you love listening to this super sad melancholy music, mm -hmm. but it makes you happy, you know? And in fact, and then you have some fascinating um, research about this. You cite about people whose favorite songs are happy, listen to them about 175 times on average. And those who favor bittersweet songs listen almost 800 times which mm -hmm. I believe because I've listened to a lot more Radiohead than I've listened to like, you know, the Beach Boys, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so what is it about music that, uh, sad music that so moves people and, and excites them really? Because that's the thing, you can understand why you get moved by it, but like, why are you, why are you drawn to it over and over? Yeah, I mean, for, for people who love this kind of music, uh, the question almost answers itself because there's something that there's something that happens when you hear it, you get into a particular state where you feel like, as they say, acutely alive and also like connected to, to the musician, to all the other people who know exactly what it is that the musician is expressing. Um, but I think what's really going on underneath it is this feeling of like the music is expressing the gap between the world as it is and the beautiful and perfect world that we wish we were a part of that we feel kind of inherently banished from but that but we but that we also feel is is kind of like just there it's just over the horizon it's just around the bend 
Um, mm-hmm. You see this expressed in so many different ways. You know, there's like Dorothy somewhere over the rainbow or, you know, this feeling mm-hmm. there's a pot of gold that's over there and we can just reach it or like all the, all those advertisements that you see where there's like a glamorous couple sitting in a convertible and they're driving around the bend and you can't quite see mm-hmm. around the bend. And right. you look at an ad like that and you think the ad is about the shiny glamorous couple but it's really about the place that they're driving to because we all mm-hmm. feel like that place is just around the bend. So, so it's like there's sorrow that we're not there yet, but there's also a kind of ecstatic feeling that, that we can practically glimpse it. Yeah. I, I feel like there's something it, it might have to do too with, um, you know, the, the method of creating something beautiful, right. You know, it, it, assuming it's it's bittersweet, it's melancholy. It's you're sort of refining and refining and refining it, and you're drawing from life to some degree, and it's it's this kind of perfect glimpse of you know it's 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 kind of life. It's the same way, um, you know, when you look at something, you look around, everything looks nice, and then you look through a lens, and suddenly everything looks different. It's just yeah. through like a camera. Like there's something about focusing that it just um, I don't know. It sort of seems a little more precious and a little more perfect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so there's something about um, looking through that lens that is just particularly beauty making, um, for right. lack of a better word. And, you know, and, and there's been this whole question and this whole tradition of like, I mean, for hundreds of years, there's been this idea of um, creativity, is it associated with mental illness? And people kind of mm-hmm. debate that back and forth, right. is it or isn't it? Um, and and there's actually studies that found that it's actually negatively, this is interesting, negatively associated with mental illness, um, which doesn't really surprise me because if you look at something like a state of depression, mm-hmm. that's actually a state in which you're of, of like acute numbness. So it would be right. anathema really to to creativity. But what they found is that um, very creative people tend to have people in their families who have suffered from mental illness, even if they themselves have not. And I think that's really interesting because it does feel like there's, um, there's some sense of like being able to get a little bit closer to the precarities of life Mm -hmm. um, that opens us up to its joys and its beauties without actually like falling over in, into the pit. Um, And, and this is reflected in a question that I keep being asked about this book, which is like, like a lot of people intuit or have experienced that, that they themselves, when they get into this bittersweet state of mind, that, that it is very creative and generative and um, connecting for them. Mm-hmm. But there's also this fear of like, what if I get into that state and I can never come out again. You know, if, if there's a feeling of like, I might fall over into the pit and not be able to climb back out. And I mm-hmm. think that that question comes from the fact that these states of a sort of debilitating type of mm-hmm. descent into sorrow and longing versus just a, versus a state of being kind of generatively alive to it all, mm-hmm. that these states are cousins of each other, or maybe they're just differences of degree, you know? and not differences of kind. And we all feel that. But at the same time, I, I I don't think that the answer to that is to be afraid of these states completely, but rather to know how to inhabit them in a generative way. So when you talk about inhabiting, because that's fascinating, and especially the thing about um, members of your family having sort of mm-hmm. depression or mental illness. And um, I mean, I, that certainly resonates with me how i do I, I i agree when you're depressed or you're feeling low even you know i won't say clinical depression the last thing you want to do is create i mean you don't really you're not inspired right you're you're the opposite of inspired and then when you climb out of it maybe you investigate it or you look into it um but i guess i wonder if um how sometimes i think of mania too though right we think about mania as being creative right i think about like uh mm-hmm. Is it Dostoevsky who wrote the um, the Gambler? You know about the he. You know he wrote that. Well, he in this big rush, he d- dictated it. And, you know, you think of all these great writers like dictating and the mania of all this stuff. But um, and that said, 
but the writing process itself, there's a revision process, right? Which people sort of ignore where you kind of go back to it quite coolly and soberly and have to make it make sense. And, and um, so there's this, uh, like you were saying, there's this sort of um, this belief that, or um, so I'm not as articulate as I should be for this interview. I apologize. I need a yeah, coffee. No clearly, um, there's this belief or this myth that you know, like um, that there's this crazy genius, you know, um, miserable, brilliant, you know, thing going on, and, and these artists do it. But in fact, um, it's a simulation of of craziness. Like if you have a crazy character, if you just like just like if you're an actor and you play a very dumb character. In fact, it usually takes a pretty intelligent person to play a convincing dumb person. So mm -hmm. if you have a, a narrator, say we're talking fiction, who's out of their minds and crazy. In fact, very often it may have originated as this sort of you know dump of like feelings, but then it takes a pretty cool eye to turn that into a believable facsimile of sort of mental disorder and of of lostness and all that. Well, I mean, I think that for most creative people, they get their best kind of initial burst in right. a, in a heightened emotional moment but mm -hmm. then but then you have to like wait for that moment to subside and then you have to kind right. of like do the redrafting you know like exactly. what was it Word, what's wordsworth or who was it who said spontaneous emotion. overflow of emotion oh one? i wasn't even, yeah but i wasn't even thinking of that yeah. like he had the idea of uh, um, emotion recollected in tranquility oh, um, yes. yeah, yeah. and i'm always struck by that because i'm like Yes, but for but you need right. to get the emotion down while yeah. it's actually happening, or you won't be able to recollect it well right. enough. Right. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Well, there's also the question of um, uh, sorry, I do have some notes, but um, yeah, sure. When people are writing, you know, um, this idea that um, that you know, some writers and some uh creators will will very much talk talk about writing through their pain right and and you talk about that you know make pain your creative offering which i love mm -hmm. i love that idea whereas other people will say no writing isn't therapy you know um and in fact i was just reading david milch's uh, memoir which I, I sent you an email about that's right um, life's work and he's a remarkable writer and he literally has a chapter title called storytelling is not therapy and yet throughout the book ironically some of his strongest moments in in stories he tells are taken directly from his most painful experiences so i don't know if he's just sort of winkingly saying that or if he has just a different concept of it maybe he makes a distinction between storytelling and writing i don't know but it, personally it seems like you know your edict of making pain your creative offering is is behind so much great great work so maybe you could talk about you know the with the impetus behind making pain your creative offering and, and how someone should do that yeah, yeah. The idea is like whatever pain you feel you can't get rid of, um, mm -hmm. make that your creative offering because like when all you know, like pain and suffering is going to come into every human life. And so the question is like, what do you do with it when it happens? And mm -hmm. I think you really only have two choices. Um, and choice number one is not really looking at it and and you mm -hmm. end up invariably taking it out on yourself or on people around you. And then choice right. number two is trying to transform it in some way to into something worthy or beautiful. Um, and, and so I, I use the words, their creative offering in a pretty broad sense. I mean, it could be like a painting or a novel or something like that, but I, I really don't mean that necessarily. And I also don't mean that it has to be some grand and recognize, you know, universally recognized scale. Like it could just right. be turning it into, you know, an act of kindness to the cashier at the grocery store next time you, mm -hmm. you show up there or, um, you know, baking a cake for your family or like whatever it is. It's a, there, there's a sense like when there's a pain, there's, there's ferment that comes with that. So it's like taking mm -hmm. that ferment and turning it into something. And, and, and it's a very human impulse to take the precise way in which you have been personally, personally wounded and, mm -hmm use that to heal someone else who is suffering from the same type of wound. I mean, like we, we right. have in, in mythology and in religion, there's the archetype of, of, of the wounded healer. I mean, mm -hmm. like whether you look at Muhammad or, or, or Jesus or Chiron and Greek, Greek mythology, um, they can all be seen as wounded healers. And, um, and I think that this is something that humans kind of paradoxically do you know like mm -hmm. 
you look at 9-11 and suddenly people are signing up to be firefighters or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the pandemic, people are signing up for medical school and nursing school. And you would say rationally that we would do the exact opposite thing. Right. Like you'd go in the opposite direction from the place you've been (laughs) wounded. Why wouldn't you? But, but somehow we don't, there's, there's just this impetus to like, you know, rescue ourselves by rescuing other people. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting corollary to that idea as well with parenting. Sometimes I'll, you'll hear from someone who had a really horrible upbringing and you'd think, oh, well, maybe they'd want to have nothing to do with being a parent or children. And in fact, they just become incredibly like loving and dedicated parents. I mean, there's certainly other bad stories of cycles of abuse and all that, but lots of people think like, I, you know, my dad left and wasn't around. So they become an amazing father or or something like that. And it is kind of counterintuitive, right? That's an amazing example. You have no, you have no model of it and yet here you are doing it. Yeah. It's an amazing example. And I think the people who pull that off and, and I think there are a lot, many more of those people who pull it off than we realize we're like, right. I think we're much more aware of the way in which cycles of abuse get repeated through the generations than we are of all the people who successfully stop that cycle and mm-hmm. you know do it right um, with with their own parenting and um, and it's such it's like it's such a grand and amazing act to be able to do that yeah and it's and actually speaking of bittersweetness it's if you're if you're watching it happen there is this bittersweetness because you're seeing sort of the, the pain that this adult had, you see it sort of reflected in their eyes. And and then you see the joy of sort of raising a child and having this, creating this childhood that they didn't have. Yeah, gonna yeah. Tear up a little, think about it, but it is, it's very powerful. Oh, I know. I mean, one of the stories that I told in Bittersweet is about the author and public defender, Renee Denfeld, who had like the most horrific imaginal, imaginable upbringing with alcoholism and sexual abuse and just terrible. Um, Her brother committed suicide. I think her mother did as well, if I'm remembering correctly. And, um, and she ended up as an adult, like not only pulling her own life together and becoming a successful author and public defender, but she, she ended up adopting, I think it was three, I mean, the number wrong, um, foster children. And, Mm -hmm. and these children themselves had been through horrific childhoods, early childhoods, and she like brought them together and kind of breathed a life into them as a family. And, and, and they are a family now and a, a functional one and a loving one. And, and it's like, they've all rescued each other that way. So like, they're all wounded healers together. Right. And I, I think we, um, we overlook the capacity for that because I think we feel there's so much of a sense because of our therapeutic culture. There's so much of a sense that the past is invariably going to dictate the present. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's so, but what we don't realize is that doesn't mean that the present has to be a repeat of the past. It means that the present could actually be a great gift of unmaking the past or, or healing the past. Um, But that's a message we don't see as often. That's true. It's, I, maybe that has to do with, well, I guess it's harder maybe, or maybe it's um, people, you know, people want to predict, right? Our brains are little prediction engines. So we think, well, that happened. So same thing's going to happen, whereas it doesn't have to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I, um, I think, I think, uh, I think oh, that consciously adopting this idea that it's possible to be a wounded healer and like all our wisdom traditions have been teaching us this mm-hmm. offers a much more hopeful model than the one that's usually on offer. <laughs> Right. Um, so that gets us into the idea of compassion, and, and you write at length about compassion. And, and um, I guess one thing I should I should say is your book, even though a lot of it is a sort of philosophical meditation and sort of a literary meditation, it's got tons of science in it, tons of research, which I find very satisfying because I'm such like a liberal artsy person. And then I'll start talking about something, and someone will say like, "Well, is there any research behind it?" And then yeah. I'll have to like scramble to prove like, "Well, yeah, it's not just you know people feeling good. It's." And again, you talked about the compassionate instinct, which I was amazed with this essentially is there's this biological imperative behind compassion. Yeah. So this is so interesting. Like, and and you really have to go back to Darwin to see this because, Mm -hmm. you know, Darwin's work is basically associated with a kind of bloody, you know, nature red and tooth and claw type of survival Mm -hmm. of the fittest. 
idea, which is true. Um, he definitely talked about that and noticed that, and that's part of reality. What gets left out of Darwin's legacy is that he also noticed that mammals and humans have this capacity where we react instinctively when we see another being in distress, we feel it vicariously and we don't feel good again until we see that distress alleviated. And he actually wrote in The Descent of Man that this is the strongest of all the human impulses. And, uh, you know, of course, no one talks about that. Um, but 150 years later comes along this guy, Dacher Keltner, who's this amazing scientist at Berkeley, um, who has this instinct about what he calls the compassionate instinct. Um, and he basically proves all these years later what Darwin was saying all along. Like he, he found that the vagus nerve, which is the, the, the biggest bundle of nerves in our bodies, regulates our breathing and digestion. And, um, and the vagus nerve becomes activated when we see another being in distress. So like when you tear up, um, you know, when you see like a, a touching commercial on TV or something, that's your vagus nerve acting mm -hmm. and it's visceral and it's pre-conscious so it's not just like yes we've learned to make nice noises about compassion because it sounds good and that's right. what we were taught in Sunday school it's not that it's like it's much more basic and visceral than that mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 primal I mean really yeah. and then I, I feel like a lot of um society especially uh nowadays is sort of like teaching away that that impulse you see little kids just sort of horror i mean if you ever when you have a little kid the first time they see like a homeless person it is just it makes no sense to them they're just like what like what who this person's just there like that doesn't make any sense and um and then of course you get inured to it and hopefully not but it tends to happen so it's it's deep within us that's really interesting because i i don't know if you had this experience with your little kids but um mm -hmm. when my kids were little we'd go to to the city and see homeless people, you know, I, I was quite annoyed and I would walk by um, and my sons would be like, why, why are you just walking by? And, and because right. of that, I, I started giving money and stopping in a way that I yeah. hadn't done before. And it was like, you need to be reminded through the eyes of somebody who hasn't absorbed all the like societal messaging that comes in. Right. Um, yeah to make you remember sometimes. Right. But I, but I think it's helpful and, and it's like, it's really worth asking, well, why is it when you look at Darwin, why is it that the message of survival of the fittest, which again mm -hmm. is true, that is part of true reality. Um, but why is it that that message is what gets lodged in the culture when this other message yeah. is and so forgotten that right. no one even knows it about him? It's also a very reductive message. People think survival of the fittest just means physical primacy, but it's not. It just means fitness for the environment. So greatest mm -hmm. fitness for the environment could be the most cooperative or collaborative group of the species. It could be an immunological advantage. It could be anything. You know? So yeah. it's people just think, oh, it's like the biggest, toughest mammal, like eating <laughs> everyone else. Mm -hmm. But you know, you see the power of a group in action. You know, I mean, the reason our species is so successful, I would arguably, and I'm, you know, the 10 millionth person to think this is because we work together. That That's it. It's not any other real advantage. Yeah, no, that's true. And like all the work out of primatology that finds that like the, the most successful primates and apes and so on tend to be the ones who are really good collaboratively. They're not like we, mm -hmm. we think it's going to be the most chest pounding, you know, biggest, right. fiercest ones. And those those types will prevail sometimes, but usually it's a very uh, precarious type of prevailing because other apes who don't like that behavior will like <laughs> gang together and, and right. then topple them. So, <laughs> right. um, you uh, in in the book you talk about developing compassion and how to develop it, and because I, I thought that was interesting um, because you have actual techniques. Do you, do you want to walk us through some of those techniques real quickly? Is that is that okay? I, I, you know, you would talk about um, like a writing exercise when um, you describe a time when someone showed you compassion or you felt it for someone else. I thought that was, you know, and that's kind of almost like a, a gratitude activity as well, that sometimes it can sound sort of very like Pollyanna-ish, but then when you do it, it can be really powerful, I've found. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll give you two of these um, techniques. And so one of them comes from um, this video that I, I mentioned in the book. It's this incredible video that was put together by the Cleveland Clinic Hospital. It was meant, they, they put it together just to teach um, empathy to their caregivers. And they meant it to be only for that audience, but it ended up going hugely viral because it's so good. And it basically just shows you in the video, it like walks you through the hospital corridors and you're walking by all these people who you would normally just walk past and not think that much about it. But in this case, in the video, it just shows you with silent captions what each person is going through at that moment. And sometimes the things they're going through are happy, like they're about to get married or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but because it's a hospital, you know, more often the captions are quite heart-wrenching. It's like yeah. waiting for their heart to come through for a transplant or, you know, there's one that like kills me every time I see it, a, a, a little girl and it, underneath it, it says going to say goodbye to her father for the last time. Um, and it's so transformative to see this video because you realize that everybody has those captions all the time and you're walking past people and just the simple act of like trying to imagine what each person's captions actually are and just remembering that we all have them that mm -hmm. the joyful ones and the sorrowful ones they're all like mixing around um just the act of imagining people's captions number one and then number two trying if it's someone you're in relationship with trying to figure out what they are that's really transformative um and then the second practice I'll tell you is, uh, is about the simple act of bowing. Um, like what, what's been found is that it's very hard to get into a compassionate state if you feel yourself to be above other people in, in whatever way, yeah. like psychologically. Um, but the simple act of bowing down mm -hmm. and cut through that and get you into a more humble state of mind which I'm sure is the reason that so many wisdom traditions have developed this as part of the practice, you know, whether it's yeah. yoga or like in Islam, bowing is so much part of the, the prayer practice mm -hmm. um, or, you know, in Japanese culture, that's so much part of sure, everyday yeah. social life. So uh, yeah, the, these, uh, these physical practices can really transform right. our hearts. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a very powerful one. Um, it's funny about bowing is uh, I used to teach Taekwondo and, and we would bow whenever we'd enter the, the right. dojang and we'd bow to each other. And um, and that was always the thing that, uh, um, you know, in America or Westerners or whatever, would always kind of hesitate about. Like it always made them feel weird. Like I got to bow to this guy? Like, who's this guy? Especially I was 25. So I'd have students who were twice my age and they, they felt like it was a dominance thing. And in fact, it was just a respect thing. And I would bow back. But um, yeah, there was always this kind of hitch early on, like, I don't know about this, but then you just got into it. And it was actually kind of, um, it was, it was nice. It was, a, it was a moment of kind of respect and a moment of acknowledging each other. Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't feel like a dominance thing at all. Yeah, it's interesting. I do think there's something in our culture that sees those types of interactions as being necessarily zero sum. You know, like if mm -hmm. I'm bowing down to you, it means that I just gave you power and took power away yeah. from myself. And, mm -hmm. and that's not how it needs to be, but that's how we perceive it. And so I think right. there's a kind of rewiring that needs to go on there. Right. And you, you write about the, the difficulties of this sort of winner loser mentality and how, how sort of pernicious that can be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how, I mean, there's this really fascinating kind of emotional history that we went through in, in the U S in particular, in the 19th century, as, as we became more focused on business and success in business, what happened is we started increasingly to ask the question, when somebody is a business success versus when they go bankrupt, is that because of external conditions of good luck or bad luck? Or is it because of some inner characteristic in the person that dictated their fate. And increasingly, we started to answer the question with the idea that there's something in the person and, mm -hmm. and, and that people like either are or aren't winners or losers. 
Right. And the more like you start looking at each other that way or at ourselves that way, the more you become terrified of anything having to do <laughs> with loss. And you wouldn't want to express any emotion that's vaguely related to the act of loss because you don't want to, above all, you don't want to be a loser. You don't want to feel like a loser. Um, mm -hmm. And and this is such a kind of, you know, binary, black and white, dichotomous way of thinking about ourselves and each other. Um, but it's a heritage we're kind of stuck with right now that I think we really need to undo. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's also, it almost seems like a flip side a little or related to the whole fixed mindset versus growth mindset, right? Because it's either, well, I am or I'm not, I'm a winner or a loser and nothing's right. going to change that, which is so destructive because it keeps you from being uh, exploratory, from being creative, from, you know, from being forgiving to yourself as well. Yeah. Yeah. And from taking risks also, because like right. the whole, the whole thing of life is like, traveling down a path where you're going to encounter, you know, mm -hmm. monsters and angels along the way, but right. if you feel like it's one or the other, you're going to be pretty afraid to go anywhere. Right. You have a great uh, moment in the book where you talk about um, self-compassion, you know, mm -hmm. learning to talk to yourself kindly, you know, as if you were, uh, I think you say as if you were like a little three-year-old or something. Mm -hmm. And um, it is true. I mean, I, I find the topic fascinating. You know, Ethan Cross had that great book, Chatter, which was a, yeah. one of our selections. Yeah. And I, I loved it. It's a great book. And because I know, I, I mean, most people, I think, experience it. And that voice is so obnoxious sometimes. <laughs> and I just think, like, who invited you? Like, also, like, what's your end game? That's the thing that gets me. Like, what's this little voice getting out of this? Like, we're we're sharing this you know, like, it's not like he can just hop out and go live with a more successful person. <laughs> <It's> like, you're <laughs> stuck here with me. You might want to just try and, like, make it better. Because, uh, yeah, this is just, just kind of Debbie Downer here. Have you found that um, becoming a dad and or I don't know if you're a dog owner like me, I became a dog yeah, owner. A dog yeah, owner. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we adopted or we, we got a dog um, two years ago. And I noticed that, and uh, you know, you know how with most dog owners, you have like a thousand different terms of endearment for your dog. Like you make up <laughs> yeah. new ones every hour. Um, yeah. I found that just having that be so much of a part of our daily lives makes it mm -hmm. easier and more natural to speak that way to yourself because it's so much just a part of your everyday patter. That's so interesting. I don't know that I've noticed that. What a great, what a great little hack. <laughs> just like, <laughs> learn to love yourself by loving your dog. Yeah. Like, huh. yeah. Like talk to yourself the way you would talk to, talk to your, your children dog. or your dog. Yeah. Like you can do yeah. better. It's okay that you ate that muffin off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or like with your dog, you're not even saying you could do better because right. you don't even expect it's it. True. It's just like automatic. Yeah, it's, it's like automatic, yeah. unconditional love. Right. Right. Or, yes. Yeah, that unconditional love, right? Which you do, of course, you're done. I mean, you're not like, come on, shape up. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, right. And you're okay. not worried about like getting the dog into college or anything like that. So, <laughs> right. so, so there's no yeah. success, the, the whole thing of winning and losing and success mar or failure markers, right. that's all like irrelevant. It's um, true. You're like, where's your executive function, dog? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that mindset, I think, is, is very helpful um, for the way we can react to our own selves. I think people, um, I think you should encourage people to talk to themselves the way they talk to their dogs, because I do yes, feel like that, that would be lots of people, right? <laughs> I, I, I honestly do it. It's kind of embarrassing. And I don't do, I don't even do it. Like now is the time to speak to yourself that way. It just sort of happens yeah. automatically. Right. Um, uh, I, you know, I was thinking, uh, you know, better, bittersweet is a huge hit. And uh, no surprise, you're a remarkable writer and you spend a lot of time really crafting beautiful and thoughtful books. Um, and I, But I also wonder if um, part of it has to do with timing as well in the sense that we're living in kind of increasingly secular times and so many of us aren't raised learning about suffering as a necessary part of life or as an inevitable part of life. In fact, I feel like with, uh, you know, every religion acknowledges it, right? You know, there's the story of Job, there's, um, the heart of Buddhism is, you know, yeah. acknowledging and realizing suffering. And then technology more and more is sort of reducing all, all pain, all, you know, inconvenience, all discomfort. Um, I mean, you used to have to like stand out and like hold your hand out in the rain and wait for a cab. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's a pretty minor, trivial example, but even that, you know, you'd have to go to the supermarket and everything's being brought to you. So there's more and more of this, this attempt to like, you know, 
move, just extinguish pain and suffering, but you can't, you just can't. And people recognize that either consciously or unconsciously. And so I think your book really, um, really taps into that. That's actually, that's such an interesting point that you make, because I have thought about the way that, um, I mean, I, I started writing the book years and years ago, long before the pandemic, but um, mm -hmm. I do think there's something about living now in these pandemic and otherwise troubled times that have, have made people look for this, these kinds of messages. Um, mm -hmm. But you're pointing at a whole different thing, which I hadn't focused on so much, but I think you're absolutely right. Like the idea that we're also living it with, we're living in a time where um, people are increasingly secular and increasingly not believing in the major or not believing in everything in the, with the major faith traditions. Right. But I also think there's an increasing, uh, sense of hunger for everything that those traditions always gave us. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think we know where that hunger is going to take us, but, but the hunger's there. I think there's a period of time where people are like, Oh, okay. Um, you know, we're in a new age and we don't care. Right. We're beyond that. And, and now we really, no, we're not beyond it because those traditions have been with us for these thousands of years for, for deep and good reasons. Sure. And, and the community that comes from it as well. And I say this as mm -hmm. someone who doesn't go to church or do anything really. And yet I feel this pull towards community. I feel this pull towards meaning, finding some sort of purpose. And a lot of that, you know, arises from interactions and, and connections with other people. And yet, and this is, sounds like an anti-technology screed, and maybe it is, <laughs> but I feel like more and more technology isolates us, right? You don't, you don't go to the restaurant and see the people making the food and, and meet the owner and, and, you know, mm -hmm. talk to the waiter. And then you don't, I don't know. You just, everything's just dialed up and I sound like a grumpy old man, so I <laughs> but I don't know. I just, I, you know, I'm from a small town and everybody, I was, I remember um, a small town in Massachusetts, you know, I don't know, population 4,000 or something. And I was little, I was five years old. Everybody knew me. I was the little Greek kid, right? I barely spoke English. And I would just, they'd see me you know, walking across the street and going to the library. And, and, you know, someone would call my mom of like, Oh, you know, uh, your son's wandering around the supermarket and then, you know, come get me. And, and, you know, I know that you can't do that everywhere. Obviously, cities are huge and more and more people living in urban areas. But there's something to be said for that feeling of like people watching out for each other, for a sense of interresponsibility um, and um, and a sense of meaning. And uh, and that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with faith. But I do feel like there's that something there with community and with, um, I don't know. I haven't thought this through. You wrote a very good book on it. I'm just kind of spitball. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 I'm, I'm totally with you. I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I saw something the other day. It, it was just a meme on social media um, mm -hmm. where somebody was saying, she was talking about how she had grown up like, in an evangelical community. And she said mm -hmm. she had always been a real believer because she would sit in services and they would play music and she would feel so moved by it. And she said, then she grew up and started going to regular concerts and yeah. she realized, oh, all this time, it was just the live music that I loved. Um, <laughs> and so like she left right. the church behind. Um, and I feel like I've had exactly the mirror image experience mm -hmm. that she had, which is starting off kind of agnostic and I still am, but also realizing that the, the moved and transformative feeling that you get when you hear music it's not just the music itself. It's like, it's because the music is, is, is pointing you to something bigger and higher, whatever that is. And mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm speaking as an agnostic as I say that, yeah. but um, I don't know. In the end, I feel like there's not that much distinction, if any, between what, what we experience when we talk about music or art or nature and mm -hmm what we mean when we talk about God, I, right. whether we're atheists or believers, I think the distinction is, is overrated if, if it exists at all. Yeah, I agree. I think also with great art, you feel very often a sense of transcendence, you know? Um, I mean, that's a, that's a big part of American, you know, history with Emerson and Thoreau mm -hmm. and the transcendentalists, this, yeah, this, yeah. Um, this, this elevation of, of spirit, and it doesn't have to be um, you know, connected to any faith, 
but it's uh, it's a it's powerful, and there is a real spirituality throughout the book, and and you know I feel like you're you're always careful to qualify it, and you know whatever you believe, you know which which I appreciate as a reader, and I'm sure you have such a huge variety of readers, but um, but that openness to it is really refreshing as someone because there's also a tendency um, to be cynical, right, and the, the divisiveness and the polarization, and to sort of um, and to read something that's just like, just open up your heart, open up, you know, consider what other people are going through, consider what, you know, forgive yourself a little. Like, I mean, I think there's also the strong uh, response coming from books like you. And I think of like Brene Brown's books as well, where this, mm -hmm. this urgent and very intelligent, and very moving um, call to like, just, just humanness is not about taking one side or shutting down. It's about openness. It's about connection. Yeah. And also uh, like about this, this, existential longing for home that we all have mm -hmm. that has been expressed in all our religions. I actually, um, when, when did it start? Like a month or two ago, um, a Muslim scholar reached out to me. She had just read Bittersweet and she's like, you know, you're writing about, and I, I hope I'm not mispronouncing this. Forgive me if I am, but she said, you're writing about the fitra. She's like, I can't believe you you wrote a whole book about your fit, fitra, if I'm saying this right, F-I-T-R-A. And it's basically that um, in Islam, it's the idea of the the soul's longing for home, you know, for, for um, right. ultimate union with the mm -hmm. divine. And, um, and so we've been, we, we've been having yeah. like a, every day we've, we've been having this long, <laughs> long, long dialogue with each other about all of this. I think we're going to record it at some point. Um, oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. But that's been really fascinating, you know, to see yeah. the way in which that, I, I, I believe that that's our essential emotional DNA is that mm -hmm. sense of longing for the ultimate home or perfection or divinity or a union or love or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. And it gets expressed through all these different traditions, but we're, we're living in such a secular time that we don't even realize that that's our emotional core. Right. Yeah. I, in fact, I remember I underlined a sentence in your book. I underlined a lot of sentences, <laughs> but this one I happened to reread today about how um, the bittersweet tradition teaches that yearning flourishes in the realm of romantic love, but it doesn't yeah. derive from it. Yeah. Rather, the yearning comes first and it exists on its own. Romantic love is just one expression of it. Mm -hmm. And that was just, that kind of blew me away. And it's not to de degrade romantic love, but it's saying it's, it's, it's an expression of this bigger, higher, you know, reaching out. Yeah, I think far from degrading romantic love, it actually elevates yeah. it to understand what it actually is, you know, that it's right. a manifestation of this greatest yearning of all and that when you have those moments in your romantic and erotic life, it's, it's like an expression of that, that most fundamental longing of all. Um, but yeah, we're not taught that we have no idea that that's what it actually is. Yeah. Um, was there anything that uh, just to get to the sort of writing of the book that surprised you like going into the book and then you were researching it and you thought like, what, this is not what I expected to happen. Honestly, everything we've just been talking about is, is really what surprised me because I had okay. no idea, you know, as I say, like I, I've been this, you know, steadfast yeah. agnostic all my life. So I did right. not like start this book looking for spiritual explanations. It didn't occur mm -hmm. to me that that would be where I would find answers. I was right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been the great, great surprise. How about, um, how have people, uh, I imagine you've got heard a lot and you've done readings and um, have there been any sort of notable uh, reactions to it? Um, what's been really cool is, well, I guess a couple different things. I mean, one mm -hmm. is how many people have written to say, oh my God, like I've been feeling this my entire life. I never had words for right. it. Um, I never thought I was supposed to talk about it. Like for some people, mm -hmm. they, they thought they shouldn't talk about it because it seemed too close to depression and things like that, that you're not supposed right. to embrace. And, and so for them, just realizing that this is actually something quite different mm -hmm. um, was really liberating, but I don't know. I mean, I guess the bottom line is I, I, 
I say this a lot. I think the reason to read and the reason to write is to have those moments where, you know, a book or a writer can express an experience that where that other where other people have had the exact identical experience right. and you've never put it into words in quite that way. Maybe you never knew that other people felt this thing. Like those are always my favorite moments of reading. Um and I'm getting those letters again and again from people. And and from a lot of people telling me that they had had playlists all their lives and mm -hmm. they never kind of knew what to call them. But like one person, one person's playlist was called something like, oh God. Um Oh, something about that holy feeling walks with the sublime. I, I can't quite remember. Um, but everyone has these names for the playlist that are kind of like grasping towards trying to put into words um, yeah. this particular feeling that feels so transcendent. Yeah, it, it is hard to articulate it. I mean, it, it takes a book. <laughs> to really yeah, it. yeah. Yeah. And that was the big struggle, honestly, with writing yeah. this book and then with talking about it afterwards. You know, it's mm -hmm. like the whole point of the book was to try to put into words something that's inherently ineffable. Right. So I guess every book has its own challenge. And that was this one. That's a pretty big one for a book. <laughs> you did a great yeah. job. <laughs> you didn't start with an easy challenge. Um, oh, you know, I have a question I meant to ask earlier from one of our members named Joanne Dare, or Durr, I pronounce it, um, and I thought I'd share it with you. Uh, I thought it was a funny, fun question. Um, I mean, it's kind of dark too. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Joanne. Um, I've had trouble crying as it was a competitive sport in my family. That's why mm. I laughed. Um, mm -hmm. I opted out. I do feel sorrow and longing, but perhaps crying helps that go deeper. Any thoughts on that? Um. I don't know, it could help it go deeper, or it could be a catharsis for it. Or I guess mm -hmm. what I would say is not really to focus very much on whether you do cry or you don't. Like, there's a lot of right. different ways to express sorrow and longing and um, yearning and transcendence and all the rest of it. And if tears aren't what come naturally to you right now, mm -hmm. so what, you know, something else will. Right. Um, that gets us into, uh, I know we only have a few more minutes left, but um, I, I was really intrigued by your section on generational pain, mm -hmm. speaking of families, you know, this yeah. idea that we inherit or we might inherit the pain of our parents and ancestors. And, you know, there's some research into epigenetics and, and that's still kind of fledgling stuff. But even so, um, can, do you want to talk about that a little? Because that was, uh, as far as surprising goes, I thought, wow, this is remarkable um, kind of field of research going on. Yeah. Oh my God. It's so amazing. Yeah. So basically I, I, I think we've all kind of known whether we've read about it or just sort of seen it in our own lives. We, mm -hmm. we know that, that pain and trauma seems to carry from one generation to another. And you can assume that it gets carried through sort of cultural patterns in a family that mm -hmm. get transmitted from the parents to the children and then to their children and so on. Um, but there's also this amazing new line of research that shows the way in which it gets transmitted genetically. Um, you know, they've looked at Holocaust survivors and people who have been through famines and all kinds of different um, expressions of trauma and found the ways in which it gets encoded in the genes. And you can also see this like in studies of mice. They did this one study where they they exposed the um, the male mice to trauma and then and then and then that mouse mated those male mm -hmm. mice mated and then they like removed the male mice from the cage so that they had absolutely zero influence on the raising of the mouse pups but they found that oh they're called pups i think they do yeah <laughs> that's really and, cute okay <laughs> and 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 they found that like the the there's a specific way that mice behave when they've been exposed to trauma and those behaviors yeah. like persisted through the generations, even though the original uh, mice who had experienced the trauma were nowhere to be seen. Um, wow. So there's just all these different studies that like show this in every which way. And, and Rachel Yehuda, who is um, a, a scientist at Columbia, who's one of the original uh, scientists looking at this, she talks about the way in which like you could you could say that 
this research is depressing because it makes you feel like, well, if you've had trauma in your family, you've just mm-hmm. inherited that gen- genetically. And what are you supposed to do about that? But she has a more hopeful take also, which is just the way trauma can be passed through the generations. So can healing also. Right. And we can heal ourselves. Like we're incredibly, you know, plastic creatures uh, mm-hmm. physically. And then we can transmit that healing to our children and our children's children as well. So it can be really helpful actually to be aware of this and to like, think of if, if you feel like your family has undergone some kind of trauma, like how do you go back and make peace with that? And how do you, I mean, it, for me, what I ended up concluding is you have to get to a place where you can do two things at the same time. And number one is to feel a sense of love and honoring of your ancestors who came before you and whatever they went through at the same time that you're carving out your own right to create a new and hopeful path forward. And and those two things can happen at the same time. Like, you know, to to opt for the hopeful path forward is not in any way to abandon your parents or your ancestors or whoever it was whose whose pains you don't want to carry with you. You, you don't have to ab- you don't have to abandon them in order to right. let their pains go. Well, I think that's wow, that's beautiful and that's I mean it's um it, it's interesting you talked about abandoning because it's true. It can, you don't want, you want to respect your, you know, where you come from, but it's also, you have your own future to, mm-hmm. um, to carve out for yourself. Yeah. And this is also one of those places where I feel like becoming a parent oneself can be really helpful because you realize how much you wish for your own children, the freedom to chart their own course and not to be held back really by anything, whether it's, you know, right. something you're transmitting to them or anybody else. Um, like you want them to have that intimate, f- that infinite freedom at the same time that you want to preserve your close bonds. Um, right. And once you realize how much you wish it for them, uh, mm-hmm. it becomes easy to direct it backwards as well. Backwards. In time. How, did you find that uh, writing this book uh, changed how you talk to your children about um negative experiences and loss and and things like that? Like, did you give different advice or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, now when things happen with them, you Um, know, and it could be something external like the pandemic, um, you know, when they were like home and not able to go to school and stuff, um, or, or it could just be like disappointments that they have. Um, I'm much more likely to like, be helping them to see that this is all just part of life, you know, that it's not Mm -hmm. the fact that something bad just happened is not unexpected. Exactly. It's just like life (laughs) has these moments. And yeah, like what I always say is we think we're conditioned to think that when things are going well, it's the main road. And when the pandemic Mm -hmm. happens or something else, that's the detour from the main road. And I don't look at it that way. I think it's all the main road and this is to be Mm -hmm. expected along with the joys and the triumphs that you hopefully have, have as well. Um, and I, I find that they are like, really, they don't say it in so many words, but there's a real relief when you put it to them that way. And that kind of a matter of fact way, because it removes the, uh, the feeling of like resistance that I think is Mm -hmm. so much of the suffering, you know, the feeling of like, but this wasn't supposed to happen. Exactly. That's, That's so much of what, is gripping kids when they get really upset. It wasn't supposed to Mm -hmm. be this way, you know, instead of like, well, it sucks, but you know, it's just kind of, (laughs) this is just one of those moments when life isn't going the way we hoped. Yeah. That's, I mean, I I think as adults, we still, I I mean, I still struggle to understand that, you know, my, your, my expectations can really set me up for disappointment. And I think, I mean, even from like, you think, you know, 50% of the time or whatever. I mean, I know good and bad are sort of you know, arbitrary, but things are not going to go your way. I mean, it's, it's, it's to be expected as opposed to, well, you know, how come I had one bad day today, but I had six good days. Like, shouldn't they all be good? Like, well, no, if you had six good days in a row, you're, you know, go to Vegas. Like, those are crazy odds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that doesn't mean like that you shouldn't be, you know, doing everything you can to make things go well and, of course. and all of that. It's just like, it's just sort of a, a sense of acceptance of, of the mm-hmm. ups and downs. 
Well, um, Susan, thank you for joining me. This has been uh, such a pleasure talking about your book. Um, I, I feel like I've, I could drive you crazy with a thousand philosophical questions, but I, gotta, <laughs> uh, I was going to bring in Rumi. I was going to bring in Rilke. So I, I pulled back a little. On, uh, oh, gosh. No. Well, we, we will keep talking because <laughs> you know, okay. I have an endless appetite for that, just, just the way you do. So um, thank you so wonderful. much. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. And this is the book again, by the way. I mean, I know everybody has it, but if you don't, just and this is great. Just give it to everyone you know. I love this. I love it so much. Thank you so, so much, Ponyo. It's always so great to be able to talk to you. And I hope before long in person again. Yes, me too. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Take care. See ya.